All right. Hi, my name is uh, David Lineweber. I was one of the addiction medicine fellows last year and currently one of the addiction medicine faculty. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, stimulant use disorder. So I don't have any uh, financial disclosures, but I do intend to talk about some um, off labeled uh, drug use, uh, for stimulant use disorder. So First, I'll go into a little bit of background information. So this graph is showing um, overdose deaths involving psychostimulants. So this would be things such as methamphetamine, cocaine um, from 1999 to 2020. The blue uh, bars are showing all psychostimulants, um, all deaths involving them from, uh, 20, uh, from 1999 to 2020. And as you can see, it's like, the rate of overdose deaths are escalating from 2015 to 2020 at a greater rate. The yellow bar is showing um, psychostimulants in combination with synthetic opioids other than methadone. So this would be things such as fentanyl. I mean, as you can see, there's a steep increase from 2019 to 2020 with deaths involving um, synthetic opioids and the use of um, psychostimulants. And the kind of greenish bar is showing um, overdose deaths involving psychostimulants without any opioids um, with them. As you can see, though, that too was also increasing from 2015 to 2020. So, what what do uh, the overdose deaths look like for Wisconsin? Um, deaths involving cocaine uh, from 2014 to 2020 was 1,595. And with other stimulants, it was 823. So this graphs I admit looks a little bit busy, but we'll first talk about the left hand side. So this is um, looking at Wisconsin deaths involving cocaine. Um, as you can see, it's more prevalent within the southeastern portion of our state with um, the majority of deaths occurring there. And as you can see too, if you look at the top bars that um, deaths involving cocaine have been increasing from 2014 to 2020. Um, on the right hand side is um, other psychostimulants. So this is things such as majority being methamphetamine. And as you can see, the death rate has also been increasing from 2014 to 2020 with an increase of rate from 2019 to 2020. And as you can see too, that um, methamphetamine is just um, um, seen more um, homogeneously across the state compared to cocaine, where the majority of deaths are occurring in the southeastern portion of our state. So why is this important? Well, there's a large economic burden to Wisconsin due to stimulant use, which is estimated to be between 424 to 875 million annually. And this is due to things such as lost productivity, drug treatment, health care costs, premature death, crime. Um, currently, there's no FDA-approved um, medications for the use of, um, uh, there's no FDA-approved medications for the treatment of stimulant use disorder, and behavioral treatments have only been shown to be moderately effective. Uh, use of stimulants, too, is associated with higher risk sexual behaviors. Here, I'll talk a little bit more about what the different type of stimulants are. So. Uh, the, the well-known ones are cocaine, methamphetamine, and MDMA. Cocaine is uh, derived from the coca bush um, and can be uh, produced into the powder form by mixing with acid. Uh, methamphetamine, that was first synthesized from ephedrine back in 1893. And MDMA was first synthesized in 1912. Then we have the other prescription stimulants, um, that's just things such as Adderall which can be prescribed for things such as um, attention uh, deficit disorder or narcolepsy. Um, then we have things such as cot, which is derived from a plant in East Africa. Then we have things such as ephedra, which are used for pseudoephedrine and ephedrine. So the a little bit more background information. So the neurobiology of a stimulant. So stimulants, the main way they act is to increase the extracellular concentration of the monoamine neurotransmitters. So this is things such as serotonin, dopamine, um, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. So cocaine works by being a transporter blocker. So it's really also known as a reuptake inhibitor. So by not allowing um, the monoamines to be reuptaked, 
they sit inside the extracellular space longer and have a longer effect. When we look at things such as methamphetamine, it's also a transporter blocker, but it also helps release the substrate. So therefore, um, releasing more of the monoamine neurotransmitters into the extracellular space to increase that concentration. So reward is mediated by the activation of the mesocortical limbic system through dopamine. So this is a combination of two pathways. The mesocortical pathway is the ventral tegmental area in the mid vein transmitting dopamine to the prefrontal cortex, so influencing our executive function or our logical reasoning. Then we also have the meso mesolimbic pathway, which is a ventral tegmental area transmitting dopamine to the nucleus accumbens which that is a pathway that influences the things such as pleasure and the positive reinforcement patients experience when they use things such as stimulants. So what happens when someone uses a stimulant? So first there's, I'll talk about the physiological symptoms that happens. So these are things such as increased heart rate, hypertension, pupillary dilation, um, sweating, increased temperature, um, and with increasing um, Amounts of stimulants can lead to things such as confusion um, and seizure. So the initial effects that patients experience is that increased energy, um, pleasure, increased alertness, uh, decreased appetite, and decreased need for sleep. Uh, so some patients will use stimulants for the pleasurable effect, but some people also use stimulants for that um, increased alertness and decreased need of sleep if they're um, in a situation such as being housing insecure and need to stay awake. Um, to kind of protect themselves at night. So people use stimulants for uh, multiple uh, different reasons. Um, as that dose increases, the dysphoric effects become more apparent. So with increased use or duration, things such as anxiety, panic attacks, hypervigilance, paranoia, and even things such as psychotic symptoms um, become more apparent. Uh, following that initial pleasurable effect, uh, patients experience some mental and physical exhaustion insomnia or hypersomnia and uh, increasing depressive symptoms. So what, uh, what does um, stimulant withdrawal look like? So the, I'm just gonna review the DSM-5 criteria for stimulant withdrawal. So the first criteria is you need a reduction of use or cessation of use of some sort of stimulant following prolonged use. The second criteria is a dysphoric mood and then two of the following symptoms. Uh, which are fatigue, vivid or unpleasant dreams, insomnia or hypersomnia, increased appetite, psychomotor retardation or agitation. And then for criteria C is that the what's happening in criteria B is causing some sort of impairment on your life, either socially, occupationally, or some other important area of functioning. And then criteria D, that the signs and symptoms are not attributable, attributable to another medical condition or another medical disorder. So withdrawal in itself doesn't produce any life-threatening effects, um, but it can lead to difficulty coping, which can lead to patients experiencing things such as suicidal ideation because of the discomfort or emotional discomfort from the withdrawal. Um, withdrawal tends to occur within 24 hours of the last use. Uh, this tends to occur a little bit earlier for things such as cocaine when compared to methamphetamine. Um, following the acute withdrawal period, patients may have um, less severe symptoms that may last another one to three weeks. This can be things such as um, low energy, low motivation, anxiety, decreased mood, difficulty concentrating. So chronic use of stimulants can lead to development of tolerance. Tolerance is really seen as a decreased experience of the euphoria from the stimulant, but they will not, patients will not have a decreased physiological response. So they'll still have pupillary dilation, tachycardia, hypertension. Uh, cognitive impairment from chronic use can persist for several months after the last use, and this can be things such as problems with memory um, or attention. Uh, chronic amphetamine or methamphetamine use can also cause a psychotic symptom. Um, this looks uh, very similar to schizophrenia with uh, paranoia and hallucinations. Um, it's important to note, too, that psychosis after cocaine use has not been reported unless that patient has had underlying uh, psychiatric conditions such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder.
Uh, there's de definitely some medical complications which can occur with stimulant use. Uh, cardiac in nature, there can be things such as myocardial infarction, arrhythmias, uh, cardiomyopathy, myocarditis. Um, with um, higher uses of stimulants, patients have also had symptoms such as seizures, uh, perforated nasal septum is uh, seen with intranasal cocaine use due to the vasoconstriction, um, infectious um, complications too, such as endocarditis or cellulitis, HIV, hepatitis C, and dental and gum problems are seen with um, um, stimulant use when it's used um, by inhalation. So uh, the psychotic symptoms and syndromes, these affect approximately 40% of methamphetamine users. Um, it's usually acute, but sometimes in um, some individuals, the symptoms may persist longer. Uh, let's see, we got something in the chat. David, that was me. And you oh. answer it. Oh, right. let me. Let me see if I can pull up. I don't know how to pull up the chat. Don't worry about the chat. I was just asking about um, like how um, like how long does somebody have to use um, meth before you start seeing some of the psychotic features? But it looks like you're about to answer it. Oh, I don't think there was like a clear definition of how long. Um, but usually it's with more. They just stated as like prolonged use, but they, it's not like really defined. Within the literature I read, I don't know if someone else has um, uh, an actual period of time, but they, I mean, prolonged use, I would estimate like maybe like, I, I, I guess I can't really say, but it's not like just with like one time use. Um, any other questions in the chat? I, don't, I just can't see it. Um, that's okay. Um, yeah. Do, I can't see the chat, so if someone sees something in the chat, just please speak up. Um, so the symptoms are you look similar to schizophrenia with the auditory and um, hallucination, tactile hallucinations, and paranoid delusions. Really, the mainstay of treatment for the psychosis is abstaining from the amphetamine. Um, you can use things such as um, antipsychotics for treatment. Um, the one study I looked at, they saw no noticeable differences with the different medications listed above. So, aripiprazole, quetiapine, haloperidol, but they did note that olanzapine was better tolerated than hal haloperidol with less um, um, extrapyramidal symptoms. So, stimulant overuse or stimulant toxicity, this can be seen as things such as hyperthermia, seizures, altered mental status, um, hypertension. The, really, the mainstay of management for um, stimulant toxicity is just supportive care, ensuring adequate airway, cardiac monitoring. If it was ingested within the last one to two hours, you can consider things such as activated charcoal. Um, to control the agitation seen within uh, stimulant toxicity, um, it's recommended to use things such as um, benzodiazepines. Um, the control of the agitation can also lead to control of the other symptoms such as tachycardia or hypertension. They do not recommend the use of antipsychotics to control agitation due to concerns of prolonged QTC and heat dissip dissipation, um, but you can consider the use of antipsychotics if higher doses of benzodiazepines are not adequately controlling the agitation or the delirium. For the hyperthermia, just initiating cooling measures, controlling the agitation with the benzodiazepines, um, antipyretics really have no role in the control of the hyperthermia because the increased body temperature is really due to the increase of muscular activity due to the patients moving around. Um, hypertension using, um, you may be able to control with the benzo, benzodiazepines, but if you aren't able to gain control, you can use things such as nifedipine or nitroprusside, but really avoiding things such as beta blockers due to the unopposed alpha stimulation. Urinary acidification can help enhance the elimination of um, stimulants, but it's not recommended because of the concern for renal failure due to the rhabdomyolysis, which is seen commonly in uh, stimulant toxicity due to the agitation of the patients moving around. So here I'll, I'll just be um, talking about the different treatments for stimulant use disorder. As I said before, there's no FDA approved medications for stimulant use disorder. Um, I did look at uh, 
So meta-analyses of, of the different treatments that have been uh, proposed for stimulant use, but there's really a lack of standardized outcomes. The majority of the literature is focused on cocaine use. The primary outcomes tend to be abstinence, and the length of the study time period really isn't that long, sometimes only 8 to 12 weeks. Um, and with the primary outcome being abstinence, um, it's a little bit hard. It makes the studies a little bit more limited. So really further research needs to be conducted, but also run through uh, some of the medications that have been proposed. So I did look at one, which was topiramate. Um, I did look, this trial was a 13 week trial, double blind placebo control with 170 participants who had cocaine and alcohol use uh, disorder who received topiramate 300 milligrams daily or placebo. Um, this trial saw that patients were more likely to be retained in treatment and more likely to be absent from cocaine during the last three weeks of the trial. Uh, with the topiramate group being 20% versus 7% of placebo, and this was statistically significant. Um, but looking at the meta analyses of topiramate, data is still limited, um, and further studies still needs to be done to determine if it's uh, beneficial overall for stimulant use disorder. Uh, sertraline, uh, this is a 12 week double blind placebo controlled with 158 participants with uh, cocaine use and co occurring depression. They're either assigned to sertraline, uh, 50 milligrams daily, sertraline and gabapentin or placebo. So there's three arms to the studies and patients need to be um, cocaine abstinent during the first two weeks while during the residential program or they're removed from the trial. Um, it was seen that sertraline, but not sertraline plus gabapentin had a lower overall percentage of cocaine positive urine samples, which is statistically significant. And the sertraline group had less return to use than the placebo group with 65.2% uh, versus 88.9% of placebo. Um, another meta-analysis looked at two trials uh, for the use of sertraline for relapse prevention in patients who were already cocaine abstinence at baseline, and they found that those patients were less likely to return to use. So sertraline has uh, some possible benefit, but it hasn't, but further studies still need to be done according to the meta-analysis. Um, we look at bupropion, um, so this is just bupropion alone. Uh, there's a 12 week double blind placebo controlled trial of 150 milligrams of bupropion uh, daily versus placebo. It had 73 participants in the trial who were um, used methamphetamine and they really, they looked at drug screens that were performed um, three times per week. They didn't find any statistically significant of findings for bupropion compared to placebo for reduction of methamphetamine cravings, reduction of depressive symptoms, or um, reduction of um, positive urine drug screens compared to placebo versus bupropion. They did do a post analysis of the um, study, which looked at uh, methamphetamine users, which were termed light users, which had only zero to two methamphetamine positive urines at baseline compared to more heavy users, which were had three to six methamphetamine positive urines at baseline. And they did find that there was a reduction of methamphetamine use when you looked at light users versus heavy users. Um, another trial was 16 weeks double blind placebo controlled of uh, bupropion versus placebo among 70 participants with chronic cocaine use, and they didn't find any significant differences between bupropion and placebo. Um, this is a more extensive study, which looked at naltrexone and bupropion was multi-site, uh, double-blinded with 403 participants with moderate or severe methamphetamine use. Um, and it was looked at a combination of naltrexone, 380 milligrams every, uh, every three weeks, um, extended release uh, versus um, extended release with extended release bupropion, 450, 450 milligrams daily for 12, uh, with the 12 week uh, trial period. Um, the primary outcome that they were looking at was three methamphetamine negative urine samples out of four samples obtained in the last two weeks of each stage. So they're testing patients at the five and six week mark and then at the 11 and 12 week, week mark. They found overall that there was um, a response within the treatment group of 13.6% compared to the placebo group of 2.5 um, with a number needed to treat of nine. Um, then also looking at uh, medication, uh, mirtazapine. So this is actually a 
two different trials I'll be talking about, but they're the second trial is a follow up to the first trial. So they had a 12 week double blind uh, trial of comparing mirtazapine 30 milligrams once daily among 60 men who have sex with men with methamphetamine use disorder, and they had a reduction in use. So uh, the methamphetamine positive urine samples at 12 weeks um, for the mirtazapine arm decreased from baseline of 73% to 44%, and in the placebo arm was 67% to 63%. So then they had a follow-up to this study, which was um, a 24-week medication period with additional 12-week follow-up um, with mirtazapine, again, among 120 cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men with methamphetamine use. Um, and they found a reduction in use um, at 24 weeks um, with the mirtazapine arm going from 85% to 63%, the placebo arm 75% to 74%. Um, reduction and for urine positivity. And then at 36 weeks, it had a urine positivity decrease from 85% to 71% of mirtazapine arm and actually increase in the placebo arm at 36 weeks from 75% to 88%. So mirtazapine definitely showed some evidence, but still more um, research needs to be done to see if it is more generalizable as um, this study looked at um, men who have sex with men only. So the last medication we talked about is the use of um, psychostimulants. So this would be um, kind of thinking of using like a more agonist therapy for the treatment of stimulant use. Um, and it showed that for a review of 14 randomized uh, controlled trials for cocaine use disorder showed some improvement of abstinence versus placebo. And one meta-analysis, another review of 26 studies on low quality evidence that psychostimulants improve sustained cocaine abstinence, but um, it didn't. When you look more into the data, it didn't show any uh, reduction of cocaine use for patients who continued to use. And a, another review of 38 trials for stimulant use showed an increased rate of sustained abstinence at two to three weeks, but still uh, more uh, research needs to be done to see if this is beneficial. Um, then we have our behavioral treatments uh, for stimulant use disorders. So for um, the matrix model has shown some evidence, but it's definitely harder to um, actually refer patients to uh, such a model because it's so extensive. So this is a combination of behavioral therapy, family education, counseling, 12 step support, um, encouraging non-drug related activities. Uh, CBT has shown to have some benefit as well. Um, and then the other one is contingency management, which is basically giving like incentives for engaging in treatment or reduction in use. So this can be things such as vouchers, rewards, or prizes. It has shown to be cost effective with $1.46 per day per participant with a low number needed to treat of three to five. It can also be uh, performed in conjunction with um, other um, settings such as um, having patients still be involved in um, individual counseling, and it can be done in the inpatient or outpatient setting. The VA actually has done this model inpatient, um, and then they can actually refer to patients to the outpatient setting too. Um, and then uh, stabilizing other medical and psychiatric comorbidities. Um, so thinking about harm reduction too, so if patients do wanna to continue to use stimulants, um, this is um, from the California Bridge website, um, going over safer ways um, for injection. So making sure that um, this is just a slide that you can share with your patients um, if they want to continue to use by injection. So make sure you're preparing yourself, find a clean, well lit area, cleaning your hands. Um, if you're, when you're preparing your own solution, using your own um, cooker um, and making sure you're trying to use sterile water if possible. A patient can use a small, piece of cotton or filled or pellet to help draw the solution up into a syringe to try to avoid any particulates, um, making sure that they're fine to vein so they can use um, a tourniquet to help with that, um, making sure that you're registering your shop before using, so making sure you actually have some uh, see blood within a syringe before um, injection and then releasing a tourniquet before um, administering the substance and using a test shot beforehand if using a new um, supply. Um, this slide just showing um, um, how to use um, cocaine through inhalation. So also making sure that you're cleaning your hands, 
making sure you're using a screen while using, making sure you're using a brass screen instead of steel wall, as it's less likely to flake off with heat and making sure that you're using your own mouthpiece so they, uh, to reduce the transmission of hepatitis C. Um, and then the, so uh, just regarding harm reduction too, that there is some um, evidence showing that the supply is contaminated. So looking at 17 different harm reduction sites in British Columbia, it showed that uh, prevalence of fentanyl was 29% um, among those who had tested, tested positive for fentanyl, though only 73% 73 reported they didn't knowingly use the fentanyl. Uh, sampling of a 101 million uh, unique urine drug screen showed that fentanyl increased from 0.9% um, in 2013 to 17.6% for a combination of cocaine and fentanyl. And methamphetamine and fentanyl positive urine samples increased from 0.9% in 2013 to 7.9% in 2018. Um, and then 10% of the stimulant containing samples contain fentanyl uh, from uh, Canada's drug analysis services. So this is um, different substances that were seized by law enforcement and tested. Um, so definitely there's um, some evidence to show that the supply is becoming contaminated and that we should probably be prescribing naloxone for patients who are using stimulants because there is a risk that they will have um, some, that they may have fentanyl within that stimulant supply that they don't know of. So also consideration of use of fentanyl test strips when using a new substance is important as well. Um, I also listed this hotline here, which is the Never Use Alone hotline, which keeps someone on the phone confidentially and they can call for help if needed um, in the event of um, overdose. So lastly, I'll just be talking about urine drug screens. So cocaine is metabolized by a plasma cholinesterase and then leads to the metabolite benzylecanine, which is inactive. Um, this can be present in the urine for up to three days, but um, can be seen upwards of 22 days with um, chronic use or heavier use of cocaine, but that there's no false positives for benzylecanine. So if you see benzylecanine on a urine drug screen, it is cocaine. For amphetamines, these can be detected in the urine drug screens between one to three days after last use. Urine pH um, can influence the amount that amphetamines excreted, so some patients will attempt to use a large amount of bicarbonate, um, raising the pH of the urine to reduce the excretion of amphetamines. But also amphetamines do have a lot of false positives. I bolded the ones that are more common, so things such as bupropranol, betalol, propranolol, ranitidine, and trazodone can show as a false positive uh, for amphetamines. So really it's recommended if a positive um, amphetamine is seen on a urine drug screen to um, have confirmatory testing uh, to determine if it is a false positive.